you've met everyone here, Lorna. Um, yes, yeah, we talked on the telephone. Oh, and, but I pilot. don't know if you've met our Lieutenant uh, Masters, Warner Purcell. Oh, uh, pleased to meet you. How was your crossing? <laughs> well, I came over five years ago, but it was lovely. <laughs> oh, now, my darling, do you want some milk or something to eat? Oh, you a sausage. Oh, no, no, you don't have to bother with that, because I'd breastfeed her. Just kidding, everybody. <laughs> Good evening. Woody Allen's Bullets Over Broadway has recently won Diane Weist the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress and also picked up six other nominations, including two for Allen himself as director and writer. It's a beautifully light and witty period piece set in the 1920s, which mixes the opening of a Broadway play with gangsters and murder. John Cusack plays a pretentious young playwright whose self-consciously arty drama is staged only because a bootlegger agrees to back it so long as his dumb girlfriend Jennifer Tilly is given a role. Weist is a theatrical grand dame who seduces Cusack, and Chaz Palminteri is outstanding as Tilly's minder, who quietly rewrites the dismal play. The cast also includes Jim Broadbent and Tracy Ullman, but not, alas, Woody Allen. Good as Cusack is, his is a part that cries out for the kind of angst and neurosis that only Allen himself can really provide. However, Allen came into the studio a few weeks ago, and we talked about bullets over Broadway and the aftermath of his legal unpleasantness with Mia Farrow last year. As I'm sure you remember, their bitter court case over the custody of their son, Satchel, and their adopted daughter, Dylan, involved accusations of child molestation against Alan. He denied them heatedly, but such mud tends to stick. Well, we discussed all that. But first, I asked him why he didn't star in the film himself. Would you, the first question I have to ask you is, that, good as John Cusack is, as David, in when it's over Broadway, mm -hmm. why didn't you play the role? I'm too old, and there's no way that I could play that role. I'm, I'm 30 years too old to play that. Uh, I just couldn't do it. It's, it's about a, a young, idealistic writer who falls in love with an older woman, and um, there's, there's no chance in the world I could do it. You, you could have fixed all that. With a few lines of dialogue here and there, you could have established an older, an older writer falling in love with a well, woman yeah, of his own age. But I mean, uh, yeah, but falling in love with a woman of his own age is not as interesting. And, and uh, you know, I couldn't be that idealistic if I was my age. I would probably be embittered or something if I hadn't succeeded as a playwright by that time. It opened up many cans of worms that I, I didn't want to deal with. If I had been years younger, I definitely would have played that part. Where did the idea come from? Is it, I mean, it's a lovely idea. You've got, you've got the backstage theater story, plus the Roaring Twenties, basically, haven't you, with, with all these violent bootleggers and gang warfare going on. I mean, how did all this come about? Well, I had the idea that uh, it would be funny for uh, a playwright uh, to want to get his play on and not be able to afford it financially, and then have a gangster come along and say, I'll back your play, but you've got to put my girlfriend in the play and give her a significant role. Uh, I thought that would, you know, it's potentially a funny idea. Um, you know, it doesn't sound so brilliant when I say it now. It's funny, but it, <laughs> at the do, time, yeah. it sounded it sounded like it had uh, some some potential. And then when I started to think about it a little bit and think of some of the other twists to it, uh, th it was an opportunity to do a film about aesthetics and about the problem of the artist and about compromise and about the difference between the artist and the man and the question of whether the artist is born or could be learned and the, the the problem of the person who emulates the artist in every conceivable way but can never emulate the core the inexplicable core that makes that person an artist i'm used to playing more overtly heroic women less tentative more alluring certainly not frigid no yes yes well uh sylvia posted is a, is a mass of neuroses. In uh, spite of the fact that I could really find nothing at all in the play to brighten her up, no real passion, no seductiveness, I, uh... Nothing? I still think that she's worth playing. Well, we could work it over, and maybe a, a touch here or there could could be added or changed to no, make sure no, that you're... No, 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 I, I wouldn't dream of you changing a word of your work for me. I mean, <laughs> God, who am I? Some vain Broadway legend. You. You're a buddy Chekhov. What is fascinating, too, about it is the fact that, that the true artist is Cheech, the Chaz Palminteri mm -hmm. plays, uh, who, who at the beginning is just a thug and a hood mm -hmm. um, and goes around killing people. Mm -hmm. And, he's, he, and uh, that's a lovely revelation when we discover that, that 
of sure, them all, he is the artist. That's really what gives the movie its, its whole resonance and plot. And he's the one who'd do anything to protect his work. Well, I feel the artist generally will. The artist is obsessed with details. The artist, uh, it's, you know, it's perhaps an over-romanticized view of an artist, but probably true. Uh, at least in certain cases, you know, the artist only sees uh, his work of art uh, as important. Uh, when the play opens, the play within the movie opens, it's a hit. Mm. And Cusack is saying to him, look, we have a hit here. Uh, you know, they like it, so the girl's not perfect, but they, they still like us. Let's leave well enough alone. But Chaz is so monomaniacal and so obsessed with, um, you know, with perfection. And I feel that, you know, artists do become, that's what sets them apart from other people. I mean, one of the things that sets them apart is that attention to detail, that they, they're perfectionists. And, and so he's, uh, he's, in his own way, a, a significant artist. I think she's doing more damage than you think. What am I going to do, fire her? I can't have her ruining my show. Your show? Since what? What were you talking about, right, your all show? All right, all right, so it's our show. But I put a lot into this, and it could be perfect. Yeah, so did I, but it's, there's concessions we have to make. You know, the show's a hit. It's going well. She's not the best we could do for the part. I'm telling you, there's plenty of other girls around. What are we going to do, Cheech? She throws the whole thing out of whack. Can't you see it? The audience Come on. doesn't know the difference. Oh, they know. They do not know. They know. They don't know how to say it, but they know. Every time I hear that voice, it's Cheech. like a knife in my Cheech. heart. She can't act. She's she listening to me. Take a shower. She makes stuff not worth Do some stuff she ain't even in. It comes out all twisted. I can't fire her. You know this. Well, don't, don't talk. Don't yell at me. I am not yelling at you, but you are too close to this. For you, it was really quite an expensive film, wasn't it? It cost mm -hmm. about $20 million. Is that because it is a period piece? Is that what mm -hmm. boosts mm -hmm. the cost? Yeah, usually I, I make less expensive films. This one had uh, a number of millions of dollars added on because of the problems of creating a period, recreating a period, is so, uh, the problems are so vast and they're so complicated and so expensive mm. that uh, the production manager will always be happy if I hand him a script that's contemporary because it's simple, you go out in the streets and shoot, you can find your things, but a period, and of course the farther back you go in the period, the tougher it gets, uh, and this is, what, 70 years ago approximately. Yeah. Is, is that a, a period in, in New York's and Broadway's history for which you have a particular nostalgia? Because it, one always gets the impression that Broadway was, was much nicer then. I, I wouldn't call it nostalgia exactly because I wasn't around no, no, in, sure. in the 20s. But I do have, you know, Americans in general do have a very affectionate uh, mythological concept of the Roaring Twenties. Oh. It was an age of, uh, of uh, lovely women in short dresses and... and those cloche hats and uh, and doing the Charleston and the birth of jazz and nightclubs and theaters and gangsters that rode on the running boards of cars with machine guns and bootleg gin and and it's a very so it's got a very very uh, colorful and appealing ambiance to it. Look at his face, Helen. <laughs> You're going to be the toast of Broadway. Why not the West End? Hmm? I'm so glad you enjoyed the show. It was extraordinary. And what's this I hear about Helen's latest? Is that true? Oh, yes. He's creating a vehicle for Helen for next season. Really? Oh, it's a little idea she's wanted to do for years. What? She plays Jesus' mother. Oh. It's a whole edible thing. Yes, he loves her, yes. wants to do it in the father. Well, you can see the complications. Of course. And, of course, we're talking to Ira Gershwin about a Ira modern Gershwin. musical version of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Quasimodo Jones. Helen has such a... a, a... A new vitality. Even her face looks so smooth. I know. The monkey glands are working. It was a great cast. Um, Chas Palminteri, I, I think, is, is an excellent discovery. I mean, it's a fairly recent discovery, isn't mm -hmm. it, on, on the scene? But it was nice to see Tracy Ullman and Jim Broadbent there, you know, from a British point of view. Where, where did you find out about Jim Broadbent? Because we've kind of cherished him for a long time now, but he hasn't really made it in the movies before. I saw him in uh, <laughs> Enchanted April, and I saw him in... The Crying Game, briefly, and then in a wonderful Mike Lee picture uh, called Life is Sweet, I oh, believe, yeah. Yeah. and, uh, you know, there was quite some brilliant acting in that by Broadbent and his, the woman who played his wife. Uh, they were both superb, and um, I always thought he would be a funny character. There's just something funny about it, and 
not only didn't he disappoint, but he was much greater than I had anticipated. He, he was wonderful from the first day and made many contributions and was funny and, and uh, improvised. And, you know, it was, I was very, very fortunate to have gotten him for that because it's not, it was not an easy role to cast. Where's your babysitter? Oh, Cheech? Yes. Oh, you don't have to worry about Cheech. Took off. Cheech? Yeah. The minute there's a chance, he always runs off to play craps. All right. It's about two hours. Why hmm? don't we let off the leash? Why yeah. Don't, uh, why don't we go in and get to know each other a bit better? Okay. Oh. That might be better. Huh? Mm -hmm. Well. Hi, Anne. Do you encourage much improvisation? Because, I mean, your scripts have always seem to be so sharply honed that I would have assumed that you said, look, these are the lines, you know, take them or leave them. I, I know you would assume that, but it's not so. I'd say just the opposite. I uh, tell the actors that they can disregard the script completely and they can change whatever lines they want and add lines, subtract lines, uh, paraphrase, because all I care about is that the scene works and uh, often the actor reading dialogue will be stilted no matter how good the actor is but when you get the actors to talk you know uh, if a man is going to shoot somebody you know you you tell them just get the the idea across to the audience get the emotional content of the scene across. you know you can say whatever words you want but get it across and they do get it across, and they're better than when I, they're better than the words I write. The words I write are the best I can do in a closed room at home. But when you're standing there with the Broadbent or Chaz Palminteri or Tracy Ullman or something, and you put them in that situation, their spontaneous uh, impulses are more true and usually better than anything I can dream up, you know, laying on my bed at home. So you, you don't give them a great deal of, of formal direction. When I'm writing. When you're writing. Oh, yeah, well, uh, exactly, yes. Yeah, yes, with the things when you're not writing, you can dream up a better than anything that's going to be in a movie, I would think. Well, now and then. <laughs> but I didn't mean to digress. No, 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 but it's, 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 a, it's a pleasant digression. Um, but but do, do, you give, do you give the cast of... You're still digressing in your mind, I can see that. For a second, you know, I was thinking, was it really a pleasant digression? Or... or but it was it was okay. It was good for a few seconds. Right, <laughs> right. So we get back to we get back to business. Do, you, you don't then, or do you give them formal direction? Um, uh, and I I don't give them any direction if I can avoid it. I never like to speak to them even if I can avoid it uh, because I'm not that social a, a person. Uh, I, I I like it when I hire them. They read the script, and you know if they take the job. I assume they feel they can do the part. How can you get it, uh, you know, break it up? That's insane. You're, you're Jack and Sally, and you've got two kids. Hey, right? hey, our kids are grown up, for Christ's sake. You know, they're in well, we college. I don't want to bore you with the details. details. You just can't get my mind yeah. around this. Since when? You guys get along so well. She's right. I mean, what, we even, have you met other people? I mean, what, what, gay, what is this Gay, gay, that isn't our business I'm at all. I'm fascinated by this. I just feel sick. Hey, we didn't want to ruin anything, okay? We want to see what it's like to be, to be, uh, you know, apart, to be apart. Right yeah. You know, don't not support us. We're finally gotten the nerve to do this, this thing. Hope of insanity. You'll be back together in one She's week. She's going to keep just... the place in, uh, in uh, Riverdale, and I'm looking for a place in town. Oh, I just feel shattered. Oh, let's eat. Hmm? What do you mean, come on, let's eat? Come on, I, I can't eat. Everybody seems to want to work in a Woody Allen movie. Uh, I imagine that with the budgets you've got, you can't possibly pay top dollar. But uh, does, anybody, does anybody ever turn you down? Uh, yes, uh, uh, sometimes they do because uh, we pay so little or the part is small. But generally speaking, that's not a problem. Generally... Uh, I do get a lot of good actors and a lot of name actors that want to work in, and, and usually it's because most of the scripts that come across their desk are um, 
you know, I don't know, helicopter chases or, you know, digital special effects movies or things. And, you know, I generally do films about people, and so there's good roles in them. And, and the way I direct, you know, they, they know they're not going to be, you know, browbeaten or, or uh, over-directed. They know they're going to be able to express themselves and be spontaneous. And I shoot very long masters, very long scenes uh, in single shots. So they know they're not going to have to do one scene and then stop and then put the camera here and do it over and put the camera here and do it over and not overlap the dialogue and match every movement they make. You know, all that technical nonsense uh, we don't do. You don't give them close-ups uh, uh, reputedly. I remember Michael Caine saying that the Woody Allen film was no good saving your best stuff for the close-ups because he doesn't give you any. <laughs> Uh, well, not not uh, conventionally. No, I don't stop and say now we'll do the close-ups. But well, that's what actors like. Isn't but it? people appear in in close-up because the camera's moving and they're moving, and there are times when uh, I feel it's important that the camera's close to their face, and I make sure within the movement that at that point the camera is close on them. But uh, but I don't stop. I don't do the scene. In, you know, in a master yeah. shot, and then stop and say, now we're going to shoot everybody's close-up, and, you know, but, but you, you'll find, I mean, Michael Caine will find, if he looks back at Hannah and her sisters, that, uh, you know, very often, no, not very often, but now and then, he is in close-up when it's necessary, and, uh, and most of the time it's more interesting when you can see the relationships of people. Yeah. You know, uh, I always feel that the close-up is uh, overly relied on, I don't think Michael was complaining anyway because no, he wasn't. Let's face he was it, he always picked up an Oscar for he, Hannah. So sure, he was he always complain? teasing me about that. Though uh, along about the the second week, he came to me and said the same thing that uh, that uh, he had been saving his best things for close-ups, but uh, then he was not get, He never got. But but he, it, no, it was not a complaint. I and mean, we had a, a terrific time working together. Actually, I want so badly to kiss her. Not here, you idiot. You've got to get her alone someplace. But I've got to proceed cautiously. This is a very delicate situation. Okay, yeah. Ask her if you can see her for lunch or a drink tomorrow. And be ready to make light of the offer if she's unresponsive. This has to be done very skillfully, very diplomatically. Did you ever read this one? Lee, I don't! Lee, Lee, I'm in love with you. You don't often see your films again, do you? Once they're finished, that's it. I don't really ever see them again uh, when they're finished because I see them a lot while I'm editing them and while, I sh while I'm shooting and I see the scenes individually and then I edit it and re-edit and cut and I've, and I've seen it, you know, now a hundred times and they're working on it and I color correct it and mix it and I see it. And then when I'm finished with it, I sign off on the film, you know, forget it. I don't want to see it anymore because, uh, you know, what for? It's, it's never going to be you know, as good as I remember. This way, at least when I sign off, I think, well, this is the best I can do. But you always think your films are failures, don't you? Well, not always, but a lot, uh, an awful lot, because, you know, there's a difference between a commercial failure, a critical failure, and a personal failure. You know, I've had many commercial failures uh, in my life where films just did not make money. I've had uh, some critical failures, not a lot, but I have had some yeah. definite critical failures. And I've had, you know, some personal failures where I, where the film may make money or may do well with the critics and may be fine. But, but what I set out to do originally, I didn't accomplish. So I've had films that, uh, that, you know, that I myself knew, I screwed up. You can't but, mention any. Well, I mean, uh, one example would be the end of Hannah and Her Sisters. Uh, you know, I had a much sad ending. Uh, Michael Caine is is having an affair with um, Hannah's sister, yeah. Mia's sister, uh, Barbara Hershinger, Hannah's sister. And uh, then she gets tired of waiting around for him to leave Hannah. And he's dawdling, and he doesn't really leave his wife, and he s keeps sleeping with her in the hotel room. And, and so finally she gets tired of waiting and meets another guy and marries him. And at the end of the picture, and this all happened in the picture on the screen, at the end of the picture, the original ending was that Michael Caine continues to love Hannah's sister. And every time they get together at a family get-together, every time he sees her, you know, he feels bad because he 
he's with his wife in a kind of, you know, lukewarm marriage and really still yearns for and lusts after uh, Barbara Hershey. Uh, mm. And so I had that ending and I shot it and I did it on the picture. And then when I showed it to friends, they loved the picture and they said, but the ending is just no good. You know, it's depressing and not the good depressing, not Chekhovianly depressing where you're you know, ennobled or, or you get a positive thing. It's just, you know, it's like it falls flat off the table. It's just, you know, peters out at the end in a sour way. And, you know, a number of close people told me this. So I felt, you know, for pres preservation's sake, I had to change the ending. And so even though that picture was a very big success, actually, critically, and a very significant uh, financial success for me, um, I was never satisfied with it at all. Only you are something. You look very beautiful. Marriage agrees with you. Everything that happened between us seems more and more hazy. I acted like such a fool. I don't know what came over me. The complete conviction that I couldn't live without you. What I put us both through. And Hannah, who, as you once said, I love much more than I realized. Hi! I didn't miss dinner, did I? No. Going back to Bullets Over Broadway, um, I went with a group of people last night. Everybody came out, I mean, chuckled all the way through. Everybody came out wearing a big, happy smile. And then, you know, I realized when you, at the time you wrote it and the circumstances which you wrote it, when you're involved in all that appalling business of the awful publicity, how could you write a comedy in those circumstances? Well, remember this, the way things looked, you know, you got all your accounts from the newspapers and the yellow press, mm -hmm. and, and you, would, you would have thought that I was home, you know, like it was the Pentagon, that my phone was ringing and the house was surrounded, or it was Bosnia or something. It was quite dull when you were at the center of it. There was not a lot really happening that was distracting and the proof is that I you know I did uh, Manhattan murder mystery I wrote and directed it and uh, I wrote and directed um, bullets over Broadway I uh, wrote and directed and starred in a movie on television I was not distracted because there wasn't sufficient action to distract me I was home writing I was in the street shooting I was in uh, all over New York shooting and there were a couple of, you know, legal things that had to be taken care of. I knew they would be taken care of eventually. You know, so my lawyer would call me once a day, if that, and say, um, you know, I'm sending some papers over for you to sign. And I would say, okay, and hang up and get back to work. What is the position now? Because I, I think it's worth pointing out that, I mean, there were never any charges brought against you. And indeed, there was never any evidence to, to suggest that the there was any truth in the allegations made against you. Mm -hmm. But what, what's the position now with, with, with regard to, to your, your children? Well, you know, it's a very effective thing. I mean, and it's the, it's the, uh, the tactic of choice to, uh, to accuse someone of uh, child molestation or child abuse um, in a acrimonious custody fight. Sure. It's become a very, very common thing to do. And common, I can understand, because it's very effective. I see my son you know, every week, uh, and that's fine. But I'm still, I still don't see my daughter. Mm. I, I, I left her, she threw her arms around me uh, and gave me a list of presents to, to bring back to her. Then the next day I was gonna see her, which was two days later. And uh, she was seven years old then, and we were, you know, close, and she was crazy about me, and I was crazy about her, I am still, of course. And now she's nine, and I have not been able to see her. That's an incredibly painful business to go through. But it was point. painful, of course, in relation to not seeing my daughter. This yeah. is, you know, as extreme pain as you can have, and, and for her not to see me. But the rest of it, if you just take that out for a minute, of course, you can't take it out because it permeates the whole equation, but if you take that out just for a minute, the rest was sort of amusing. I mean, it was sort of educative and amusing. I got a good lesson about what the legal system is in the United States, what, what the professional psychiatric system is. Um, you know, I, I learned what lawyers do. Uh, there were many, many 
funny things that appeared in the press that uh, my friends and I found quite amusing. You know, as I say, you know, of course I didn't do anything. I wasn't, you know, um, charged with anything, and and all all, all investigations into it said, of course, nothing happened. Uh, and even murderers, even people that, that actually commit murder and are accused and convicted of murder, that admit to murders and are in prison, see their children. Sure. Yeah. And here am I, never accused, you know, never um, charged with anything, and was perfectly able to see my son. It's so illogical. Uh, you know, I see him, and he goes home at the end of uh, those times we spend together. I see him every week, and we go places together and do things, and he goes home, and of course has got to tell his sister about it, why she can't see me is just one of the cruelties and, and um, irrationalities of the legal, uh, you know, the legal system and the, the, the poor uh, adjudication of, of the case. Did it have any effect on, on the public appreciation of your work? I mean, did, did the box office take of the films <laughs> drop? Or no, they, my, my box office dropped 15 years ago. I, 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 I never did well at the box office. and. You know, I did the exact same today, last year, the year before, and 15 years ago. I've always had a problem getting big audiences, mm. always. And certainly in the United States. In Europe, I haven't. But in the United States, I've always had a problem for years. Um, and uh, no, there was no resonance whatsoever. I mean, the films that came out at the apogee of the crisis uh, made uh, identically what the films before it made and after. But those films hadn't made that much money, so that's not saying very much. Well, now, after Bullets Over Broadway, what is the next film that audiences are going to shun of yours? Uh, they're going to shun uh, a film, a romantic comedy, uh, in which I'm married to Helena Bonham Carter and uh, are circuitously involved with Mira Sorvino, whilst F. Murray Abraham uh, flits through the movie, uh, dispensing wisdom and insight. And uh, it's a New York romantic comedy in which I play a sports journalist and Helena plays an art dealer uh, wherein we marry uh, to uh, some avail and later no avail. And um, it's, uh, I don't know what else I could tell you about it. It's, uh, I don't want to ruin the story before you see it, but it's a, hopefully a funny movie. I mean, I'm trying my best to make it uh, a funny movie. I look forward very much to shunning that one. In the meantime, I shall urge everybody to go and see Bullets Over Broadway. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. In a minute, we know. There's film comedy from Woody Allen coming next on BBC One, The Purple Rose of Cairo.